All right. Uh, now, I think it would be important for us to start uh, to start off with um, a particular um, set of distinctions because we're talking about debt resistance and its history. But in order to talk about debt resistance, we have to get a sense of what debt is. And uh, it's also very important to understand the fact that there are many kinds of debt and two kinds of debt that have been most important, I think, in the history of uh, debt resistance is the kind of debt that uh, those who borrow money in order to make money get into, okay, contract. Mm -hmm. That kind of debt, let's call it uh, profit debt, mm -hmm. debt that was gotten into in order to make a profit on the one side. And then on the other side, there are kinds of debt that people uh, contract that are meant to buy particular things, particular commodities that will satisfy needs or desires. So I'll call that commodity debt. I think that uh, these two kinds of debt, you see, are we clear about what What about survival debt? Well, it's exactly that in terms of um, many times in order to survive, what we mean by survival in a society where it's a monetary society is to have the money to buy the basic commodities you need to survive, right? So that, that's the distinction that I'm, I'm not saying that these are the only kinds of debt that we have. There's also other kinds of debt that are related to the state, to the government has its own kinds of debt. Okay. Now these types of debt, these two types of debt, have their own kind of resistance and at the same time they don't have a very, it's very complex what happens with these two kinds of debt in terms of the class of people that contract these debts. Uh, for example, let, let me just, profit debt, the debt that people get into in order to make money from the money they borrow, okay? That, that profit debt, of course, usually goes to people who are capitalists, who are wealthy and who have uh, uh, interest in getting money to make money. But there are also others in the history of debt uh, who are not, who are really interested in subsistence, not interested in making money. But in a monetary society, often you need to have some money just to subsist. This is something we, we all experienced in our lives. Um, so often, uh, poor farmers, small, basically trades people, um, merchants, small merchants and so on, what we call small business people, men and women, um, often have to borrow money as well to make some money to subsist, not to make profits. Okay? So that's one kind of, uh, uh, kind of uh, complexity that we have to deal with in, uh, in with with debtors' movements, because increasingly we find, when we look at them, they're often in, there's often some interclass composition of these movements, uh, which is a little bit different than, let's say, for example, wage struggles, where capitalists are well, not wage workers. So, but uh, let's give you, let me give you another example of. Uh, of the kind of complexity that can develop with with debt and debt struggles, uh, which it, which is, for example, many people who are capitalists or wealthy and who use their who use debt to make money also consume, also take out debts in order to to make their um, 
you know, yachts, to buy their yachts, to, buy, <laughs> to go on their vacations and so on. They are also, um, they often get into debt in order to satisfy their own immediate needs and desires. Okay? So, for example, in that sense, commodity debt is not just the debt of working class people, of, of uh, proletarians. Um, and in fact, when we, when we look at some of the history, uh, we'll actually discover that in fact there are strange connections in debt resistance movements that often bring these two types of uh, uh, classes together, elements of those classes together. Finally, I would say, just to, as an example, because the complexities are, are some things that we have to confront. It's not a, a simple, straightforward, this is what the capitalists own, and this is what working class people own. And their debts are fundamentally different. You know, there are overlaps. So, for example, increasingly, uh, people, many of you are uh, perhaps uh, students or people who have gotten into a uh, student loan debt. And what kind of debt is that? Is that commodity debt? <laughs> Do you, for example, go to buy a, an education at a, a university or college uh, in order to enjoy the particular types of uh, mental activities that we have? Or is it a profit debt? In other words, are you using the money in order to make money? What? The money. It's a commodity. Depends on the study. In what sense? <laughs> well, let's say I thought it was great to study art because I got a lot of enjoyment out of it. Right? Uh -huh. But let's say um, I went to MIT because I wanted to go work on Wall Street. Okay, so in that sense, uh, you're saying that the education can be a, a, a really a complex, it's a big question, it's, it depends upon the particular circumstances. In, in fact, increasingly, we're told that the kind of um, debt that uh, people who are going to universities accrue is a kind of debt that arises from the fact that they're little capitalists themselves. Right? They invest in themselves. They invest in their ability to sell their labor, labor power to be picky, uh, uh, at a higher price. Okay? But in that sense, it's not quite a profit. Um, it's not a kind of, kind of a profit debt. Because, in fact, what you're dealing with is is a strange kind of commodity which is called the, your labor power, your ability to work for someone else. Okay? Uh, because, at least in the tradition that I come from, that labor power is the basis upon which profits come. It's how people in this society actually make profits. So, I'm bringing up this issue. I don't want to, I'm not going to settle it now. Uh, I'm sure that all of us will have to think about it. Um, but um, what I'm interested in doing is um, bringing to your, before you a, uh, a, the following problem. If we're dealing with a debt resistors movement, we have to recognize that we can be a product of, we have to find out exactly what the debt is that's being resisted. Any questions, any thoughts about this, this, this kind of uh, preface to the discussion? Yes? So, uh, I'm having a hard time believing there's only these two kinds of debt. Um, and, but if, if so, is profit debt, because uh, uh, like maybe student debt seems to be an investment in yourself, 
that you hope to profit from, similar to like upgrading your bathroom in your house that you might sell down the road. Mm. So an investment debt in, in those kinds of things seems to be a commodity in, in your terms. And uh, a profit is a profit debt directly related to the money you're borrowing, or can you actually buy capital? Is, is capital, I mean, obviously it is. Where, where's, where's the line between the two? Or do you have one? Well, first, these are not exhausted of the kinds of debt that exist. So that, that's the first point that I want to make. Uh, but the, the, the second point is, uh, I would say that I make a, I, I, I think that there's a, a distinction to be made between the kind of um, what happens when you 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 take money in order to increase the value of your labor power versus you take money to invest in, in order to make more money on the basis of that investment. That one thing is related to wages, hmm. and the other is related to profits. Okay. So you upgraded a kitchen to sell a house. If you upgraded the kitchen to sell the house, yes. Here, here is a transformation that occurs from the situation where you have a commodity that you're enjoying to suddenly transforming it into, a, in effect, a, a, a commodity that would be used for exchange, yes. Here's a, an extremely, uh, in fact, this is what we're, we're being told at this time by the neoliberal economists. We're being told that, in fact, we're little capitalists ourselves. We just don't, um, don't invest it in factories or in offices. We just invest it in a little thing called our own labor power. Right? But our labor power, it, they tell us, is a piece of capital. It's our little capital. <laughs> okay? So I, in that sense, I would say that um, the field that we're in is, is, a, is an extremely complex field and it's something that we need to be able to uh, recognize. It's not a, a, a simple, straightforward um, uh, territory that we're investigating as we develop the history of debt resistance. Okay? Um, and let me just, uh, with, with that said, uh, what, what time is it right now? All right, so I'm going to, um, I'd like to sketch a little bit about the history of um, debt resistance. And uh, just, to, just to give you some simple uh, examples of the kind of complexity that you deal with when trying to deal, you know, trying to write such a history. Okay. Um, One place that I often have started in terms of the, um, the history of debt resistance is in, the, is in ancient Greece and Rome. Part of the reason being that it's in those societies that much of the legal and political discourse that we, are, we have, even up to today, uh, comes from. Uh, this is not to say that there aren't uh, important parts of the history of debt that you don't find uh, in other parts of the, um, of the world thousands of years ago. But uh, I just want, want to bring up the fact that, um, in, for example, in ancient Rome, uh, debt was an extremely uh, dangerous situation to be in because your creditor considered your body to be theirs until you finished paying the debt. And in fact, the, main, the famous idea of the pound of flesh, right, actually comes out of the, the history of Rome. And that if you couldn't pay back your debt, the, the creditor had the power to, in effect, literally take that pound of flesh and eat it. Right? It was, it's a very harsh 
and, and some of the anxiety that we have around death, I'm sure, echoes back into that period, these thousands of years behind it, that kind of terror that, that connects up with death that we have not yet tamed in, in the struggles that have arrived around, around death. But in ancient Rome also, although death was was an uh, extremely uh, dangerous situation to be in, many Romans, both wealthy and poor, found themselves in death. And many of the insurrections and civil wars that took place in ancient Rome uh, were not just slave revolts, although there were many of those, but there were also many revolts of debtors. Uh, I, one example that I remembered, I studied uh, classics in, uh, uh, in college, again, for my own pleasure, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I remember reading Cicero and his orations against Catalan. I don't know if, uh, if you've ever, ever, ever seen them, but I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, this ancient Roman orator named um, Cicero, and who wrote these orations against this man who he presented as this most terrible of human beings. Now, what did Catiline, and, 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 and if you take Cicero at his word, of course, he was a terrible guy, but I never actually spent much time trying to figure out why he was so terrible, aside from the fact that, uh, that, that he was presumably this, uh, this amoral kind of person until I realized that the bad, the worst thing that he was going to do was to demand the tabla nova, the new tables, which in ancient, uh, in Latin, meant the cancellation of debts. His conspiracy was directed towards those Roman wealthy who became bankrupt and the urban poor who had faced a situation of rising prices in the, in the decade before and had gone into debt in order to survive, because Rome at that time had become a monetary society. Uh, Catiline, in effect, brought these people together and uh, created an army to assault Rome and one of the first political projects of this army was to, in effect, get rid of death and cancel death. Uh, Catiline was not alone. Again and again in the history of Rome, we see that there is a, along with the slave rebel rebellions that we know a lot of, of course the most famous one, the Spartacus Rebellion, you know, who we love and still, you know, still, still. we even see that famous uh, Spartacus movie with Kirk Douglas, <laughs> but there's no Catiline movie, I think. Yet. <laughs> but perhaps with the, the development of of the uh, of a debtors resistance movement, we'll have a Catiline movie where we won't uh, where, where we'll see um, who would play with Catiline. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, you'll think about that. Okay. Uh, in ancient Greece, uh, there was also, uh, with the beginning of monetarization of the Greek society and economy in the seventh century, uh, the rise of, of uh, increasing debt, and not only debt, but debt enslavement. Increasingly in Athens, uh, in the uh, seventh century, more and more people who took out debt, especially small farmers, um, began to deal with the fact that uh, they couldn't pay off their debts and discovered that either they or their children had to be given over to their creditors in order to pay off the debts. And increasingly, uh, Athens began to have not only slaves from the old type of slave, the slave that was uh, gotten through warfare, you know, 
apparently in ancient uh, Athens and Greece, that type of slavery was accepted as, a, as okay. But increasingly, what begins to happen is that more and more slaves are brought into being because they couldn't pay their debts. So debt enslavement began to have a situation where Athenian was enslaving Athenian. And as a consequence, what begins to happen is that slaves who had been debtors begin to organize themselves and begin to revolt, revolt and to have insurrections. You know, the history of, the history of debtors' resistance is a very violent history. And uh, if I, I, don't, I won't have the time to bring it down to the 21st century. But, you know, when we look at the history of contemporary debtors' movements, we'll see that they are not the, you know, that we're, when we're dealing with debt, uh, we're dealing with forces that are very, very uh, repressive, and the forms of re rebellion against them often are extremely, um, and upsettingly, uh, and violent, as we've seen. Uh, but, uh, what uh, Athens especially, but also other Greek societies uh, began to uh, experience is more and more internal rebellions um, to the point where there was a decision made uh, in order to stop this rebellion to end debt slavery. And in fact, if you look at the history of um, political philosophy. And if we look at the two great thinkers uh, of the ancient Greek world, uh, who we still study today, Aristotle and Plato, from their point of view, what democracy is all about, you know, when we say this is what democracy looks like, from their point of view, democracy had as its central pillar, the central demand, the cancellation of debts. Mm -hmm. In fact, we will see, if we had time, uh, which I don't think we do, um, you know, we'd see that one of the most important things that the founders of the United States, of this, this country, uh, had to do, had to face, was how are they going to have something like a democracy without the cancellation of debts? It's not easy. But they've managed. That's their genius, and it's and it really is something that they have to. You know, we, we must study. What did they do to figure that out? Because, um, in effect, they made democracy safe for the wealthy. Right? And it, it, it ain't easy. And for thousands of years, it was thought impossible. So actually. When we look at debtors' movements in the history of the United States, we see that they go to the heart of the way this republic was, was founded and uh, begin to uh, go to the heart of the, of the matter. Okay, so uh, one of the consequences in, in, in ancient Greece and Rome, they, we experienced the tremendous struggles revolutions, insurrections that happened again and again around this uh, question of debt and um, to the point where with the fall of Rome and uh, the beginning of um, the uh, what we call often the medieval world, Charlemagne's um, uh, Holy Roman Empire, the, 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 the efforts to transform um, what had been le remains of the of the em of the Roman Empire? Uh, one of the first things that happens is that, in fact, uh, usury, interest on high interest on debt, is in effect outlawed. So, for beginning roughly about 800 uh, after in the, in the so-called Common Era. Um, in effect, debt becomes illegal if it's based upon uh, any kind of interest. Christian was not supposed to 
put Christian into debt. And in fact, it's also true of the Islamic world, right? Muslim is not supposed to take interest for a fellow Muslim. And that was something that went on for uh, more than a thousand years. And in fact, in the Islamic world, it's still the case. Okay? And it's only in the beginning of the, well, actually, the, e the end of uh, the laws against usury begin to uh, appear only in the 16th and 17th centuries, mm. and in some parts of Europe, continue down to the 19th century. It's very, it's, we think that the kind of debt and interest on debt is something that is uh, sort of natural, it's going to have to happen. That's not the case. Uh, and in fact, uh, if you ever want to see how violent the anger towards creditors was in the medieval world, just look at uh, Dante's Inferno. In mm. the seventh circle of hell, there you find usurers. Mm. You know, there's all the people we were out against yesterday. They, with their departure from this life, down they go. <laughs> to those who do violence against nature, and violence against the word of God. And they did violence against nature because, as far as Dante was concerned, making money from money is unnatural. Mm. In order to make money, you have to do something, make something, <laughs> create something. If you just use money to make money, you're going against the fundamental principles that, as far as Dante was concerned, structured the universe. So this type of society that we're living in, from his point of view, hell. Okay, and we are living in hell. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it's it's a pretty terrible. <laughs> you know, the inferno is extremely graphic in its images. So the, what happens to the usurer, to the predator, uh, is uh, is pretty nasty business. Falcon. Well, you see, there it is. The omens are here. <laughs> the omens would say there's something happening. <laughs> so, yeah, so what happens in the, um, uh, in the development of, uh, in this, this long history, is that there was a period when, in fact, the, the type of uh, debtors' movements that uh, we know of did not have the kind of debt that we now know of to resist. Technically, uh, debt was supposed to, um, debt that accrues interest was, was supposed to be outlawed. Now, of course, we know stories where, in fact, this doesn't happen. And, of course, the classic one being the Merchant of Venice. Right? Uh, and the, way it, the way it happened. But what we want to, what I want to do now is just to, um, again, what time is it now? Sorry, 5.42. Okay. Um, excuse me. Uh, okay, are, are we okay now, up to now? Are there any questions, thoughts, objections? No? Okay. Because I'd like to get into the discussion of what happens with the formation of this republic. This very, it's a republic that, as I said, was built upon trying to create a system where there would be some modicum of democratic process without the debtors canceling the debts. Mm -hmm. okay. And in fact, we have very good evidence for this. I, I, I'm not, uh, I didn't invent this. You know, we have very good evidence because in uh, 1786, uh, 
more or less um, three, three years after the end of the Revolutionary War, veterans of that war took up arms in western Massachusetts and uh, under the leadership of Daniel Shays uh, demanded the cancellation of debts, the end of debt imprisonment, and the end of the control of the economy of their world by, I suppose, the, the Goldman Sachs of that period who were living not in New York but in Boston. <laughs> They organized their, themselves. They were, since they were veterans, they knew how to do it. And they didn't have to start from scratch. And so they organized themselves in militias and went to the courthouses where the, the creditors were foreclosing on people's homes and businesses and um, farms and uh, surrounded the courthouses all throughout Western Massachusetts and basically intimidated the courts so that the courts would basically stop functioning, stop operating. And whenever they heard of any other case that was coming up, they would come and surround the courthouse and basically stop proceedings until, in effect, the, the, um, the, foreclosure, the, the, the foreclosure requests were canceled. So, in fact, this is really the, the major uh, of event that led to the formation of the U.S. Constitution because when they called out the so-called real militia to attack the militias organized by the debt rebel rebels, um, they wouldn't shoot upon their fellow people because they were actually their neighbors. This is the nature of those kinds of militias at all the form of military organization that was required by, in effect, the Articles of Confederation, which we're all told was a stupid idea. <laughs> but people should really reread the Articles of Confederation and see that actually there were some very interesting points. Um, but one of the major problems uh, that um, was the foundation of the, of the Constitution was the recognition that if um, if rebellions by debtors, this type of armed debt resistance continues, uh, that assumption that you can construct a republic and not have cancellation of debts is out of the question. So one of the first things that they required of a constitution is the formation of a of an army, a centralized army, to bring to bear uh, armed force that would not be neighbor against neighbor, but people from outside of the area would be could be brought in under the federal government's army to fight against the demands for cancellation of debts that were widespread and that in Western Massachusetts, of course, and fear, and there was a tremendous fear that this would spread. Of course it would spread, and they knew from reading their Plato and Aristotle, which they were <laughs> very careful students yeah. of, that uh, it, it was lurking. This was at the heart of the story of what... See, that's why when we were out yesterday, I think, uh, you know, when the police took, arrested 180 of our people, you know, uh, they were doing the same thing that uh, are, that, that was re repeated again in the latter part of the 18 of the 1780s, and it's because this is a central linkage. When we touch these things, it's like touching the third rail. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very serious what we're dealing with here. Um, so I would want to, and in fact, the Constitution was was came through a year after the Shays' Rebellion, and um, it was quite effective out there in st instilling the demands for wage can uh, uh, of debt cancellation and the end of uh, debt imprisonment, because you have to remember that in the first decades of the new Republic of Freedom, there were ma many debt debtors' prisons all throughout the country, including here in New York. 
the struggle against debtors' prisons uh, was was complex because it wasn't just um, one class that was involved. There were many different kinds of debtors that were put into debtors' prison at that time, and so uh, the struggle against debtors' prison found often some strange bedfellows, poor farmers and wealthy but uh, bankrupted uh, capitalists mm. often found themselves in the same prison. And eventually, most of the, it went by state, state by state, uh, but eventually by the end of the Civil War, the debtors' prisons had, had ended. But there was almost uh, 80 to uh, 100 years of debtors' prisons in this country. And in fact, I fear that we might begin to see a return to debtors in prison. Uh, I think all of us are familiar with these developments. So, okay, uh, the history of this country is um, there, there, there were in different periods of, um, of crisis uh, debt, or, debt resistors movements. And, uh, and I'll mention just uh, what was often called the populist movement in the latter part of the uh, 19th century and the early years of the 20th century, which um, in effect had, had their roots in the um, tremendous um, foreclosure, rate of foreclosure that was taking place in the crisis, especially of the 1890s. Where farmers were beginning to lose more and more of their, uh, their land, they had to sell it in order to pay off debts. And uh, the populist movement begins in response to this the demand that, in fact, these debts be cancelled. And uh, they um, technically, the, um, the populist movement did not achieve what its purpose is stated purposes were, right? but in effect, in the end, uh, we, we see that um, the, the, if we look at some of the legislation that took place um, during the Depression in the 1930s, we see that many of the demands of the populist movement actually were implemented. And we have to also realize um, this is something I, um, you know, I think it's very important. We have to realize that, yes, when we're in a political movement, we have to fight with no um, backtracking for our basic demands. But we must also realize that uh, even if our basic demands are not immediately satisfied, if we have changed the, the balances of force mm -hmm. by our actions, that starts a process that will, perhaps we won't see it. Certainly, I won't see. It. I don't think. But we we might not see it. But it starts that the only kind of process that will transform uh, the, the the type of injustice that we're, we're struggling against. Okay. Uh, is there any question, thoughts? In this because uh, I've been doing my best. Yeah. I just wanted to, if you might mention any other more recent um, debt resistance movements and, and resources that we can look to, you don't have time to talk about them, but if there's books or websites or information that we can get well, about different friends, debt resistance movements. You have the My Little Pocket. <laughs> ta -da. This is a major resource. I'm telling you. You know, I, I was uh, absent AWOL, right? absent without leave this summer. But uh, again, in, in my work, in, in uh, political work around dead resistance. But we have comrades here, people like, uh, if I may say, Winter, uh, and many others who worked all summer to produce this. And this is a, a major piece of work. And it's the start of, a, uh, as I said, it's the start of many different types of studies and actions. So get it, okay? And within it, you'll see some uh, bibliography. The, the 
that uh, you can uh, use. And it's it's free online. It's free online as well. Yeah. 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 So you write for strike that. Strike that org. Strike that. No no uh, space. Strike that org. Okay. You get it and uh, enjoy it because this will be important.